I grew up in a really small town. They, I mean, it took like 45 minutes to get to the mall. There were no stoplights in my town. And you could walk to the local grocery store or the local doctor's office or what have you. And I want to tell you a story about how I finally learned that the only way to survive in life is to know what you're dealing with. That's actually the title of my talk today, uh, my warrior talk today. You got to know what you're dealing with. Now, this talk, before you even get vested in the talk, I want you to know is for people that are dealing with addiction in their family dynamic. So you're impacted some way, shape, or form by an addict or an alcoholic. And knowing what you're dealing with is going to be one of these life-saving warrior talks that I'm going to pour into you today so that you leave this conversation feeling more equipped, more empowered than you did when you joined the conversation in the first place. So if you want to go deeper, by the way, and you really know that you do need support on this journey, you need to know exactly what to do, you need all the help you can get, then I want you to go over to HeidiRain.com and fill out a request for more information so you can see about the different program options we have to support you on your whole family's recovery journey. Now, you walk to the doctor, right? So I'm like six years old and my mom goes, all right, you got to go to the doctor to get some shots. And first of all, I had never, to my memory, had any shots. I'm sure I had at one point or another, but I had a phobia around that. And I just remember the walk seemed like 10 miles from my house to the doctor's office. And it wasn't, it was probably a 20 minute walk. But I remember the whole walk at six years old, thinking to myself, oh my God, uh, what's this going to be? They're going to put, you know, put shots in my arm and it's going to be terrible. And I had worked myself up to the point of absolutely no return. And my mom's like, you're fine. You're fine. It's not that bad. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And, you know, doing the best she could or whatever. So I get there, I get the shot and lo and behold, it was really not that big of a deal. You know, I mean, it, it hurt. I think I got that, that tuberculosis, whatever that was with all the prongs and the pricks. And there were lots of them. So one of the things that I didn't anticipate was how many I was going to have. And I, you think, oh, you're done, right? It's just one and you're done. And oh, thank God that's over with, but no. So I get through the thing. And my mom had said, hey, look, if you guys are good, you know, we'll go over to the, the store across the street, the grocery bag, and I'll let you guys get a sandwich or snacks or whatever. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get, I'm going to get something from the grocery bag today. <laughs> so I get the, get the shots. I get up and I go over to the grocery bag. We walk just right across the street and I'm standing at the hoagie place where you can order a sandwich. And I was thinking I was like going to get like salami or something. I don't know. And I'm standing there and all of a sudden I start sliding down the bun, uh, the, uh, the buns. There was this whole rack of buns and I just start sliding down and pushing the buns off in slow motion one, <laughs> one bun pack at a time. And I could like vaguely kind of hear what's going on. I'm like, my mom's like, get up, get up. Oh, what are you doing? Get up, stop screwing, stop screwing around, you know, yelling. But really what happened was I'd passed out. I had myself so worked up from that whole incident that after it was over, my body was just like, nope, you're shutting down. And I have to tell you, I developed a phobia around getting shots or having to have needles on any way, shape or form ever since then. And I know this is a delicate subject to even be talking about uh, needles whenever, you know, I'm dealing, we're dealing with addiction, but, but stay with me because I, I really do believe that it is, a, it's an appropriate kind of, um, an allegory for you to, to see how being prepared is the antidote to most all fear and all panic in our lives. But I know that intrinsically, you know, growing up in an addicted household, one of the superpowers that I had and many kids do when they grow up in addiction is the power to predict. You kind of are developed this, you know, today we call that an empath, but back in the day, we called it survival skills where you need to know exactly what was going to happen and when it was going to happen. And you needed to be able to kind of have your own little crystal ball where you could predict the future. Because if you could do that as a little kid, if you could know how many drinks dad had had or, or what that argument was going to lead to, then you could probably prevent bad things from happening. So when you become an adult after that, anything that feels like it's out of control or you have no control over, or you don't know the outcome can lead to a panic type of situation. Now, so what am I saying? 
am I saying, well, that means that you should just get used to the uncertainty and you should be able to live in that gray area of your life? Well, sure, there's value in that. But I think when we're dealing with addiction, I know what saved my life growing up and what has saved the hundreds of lives of people that I've helped over the course of this last decade is knowing what you're dealing with. You've got to know what you're dealing with. Now, I can know that in addiction. I can know that, yep, if I know what I'm dealing with, that's great because then, then I know exactly how to handle it, right? Um, this thread of me being afraid of going to the doctor or getting shots continued on to, even though I was successful in those other areas and this other thing, I just, I couldn't overcome that. And I remember, I mean, I, I want to tell you, this is so crazy. This is how bad it was. I had a natural childbirth versus, versus getting an epidural. I was so terrified of the epidural and whatever they were going to do that I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and have a natural childbirth instead because that's just going to be better. I mean, in my mind, the, the unknown of the childbirth, I had watched enough videos. I had researched enough natural childbirths. I did the hypno babies classes. I was like, you know what? I'm more prepared for a natural childbirth than the unknown of what's going to happen with that epidural. So not too long ago, I went back to the doctor because you might see this little uh, black and blue mark I have under my eye right now, because I just got back from a doctor where I had this vein underneath my eye that was really bothering me. And it was really, you know, like big and getting bigger and bigger the, the older I got. So I was like, you know, I, I guess I can probably do something about that. I didn't realize I could. And then I found out I could. So I did. And I get my husband and we go into the doctor and I'm laying there and he's like, do you have any questions for me? And I'm like, no, you know, okay. So, um, stay out of the sun, you know, on and on. And so I lay down and he starts the process and he goes to put the shot, the medication into the vein. And all of a sudden, what I think is going to be like a little tox action, a little Botox action, right? Just like in and out, burr, dick, 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 dick. all of a sudden he starts like taking his time in there and he's like slowly putting the medication into the vein, like one little tiny, tiny bit at a time. And all of a sudden I wasn't expecting that. And I got myself so freaking worked up that in the middle of that experience, I passed out. I passed out. I, I jerked. You know, when I pass out, I jerk. I do all these weird things. I came to my husband's there. I'm sweating profusely. And the doctor's like, you know, the doctor, he's like, you're fine. It's okay. You know, let me know how you would like to proceed you know, if you would want to do this or not, if you want to continue on, you know, if you want to continue on or come back another day. And that's when it hit me that my whole life I had been applying how to know, how to know what I'm dealing with to get through something. Right. So I used that logic here and I thought, okay, well, Hey, I wasn't prepared that it was going to take so long. So how long is it? How many injections is it? How long am I going to be sitting here? What's the recovery time after that? And I asked every question that I could possibly need to know, which is what helps me survive any scary incident. But right after that, my second question was one that I didn't realize that we all need to be asking ourselves every single time is, is this something now that I know what I'm dealing with? is this something I want to deal in? Now, I made the decision that it was worth it for me because I wanted to get that taken care of. So I said, now I know what to expect. And yes, I want to go ahead. I know what I'm dealing with and I'm going to go in eyes wide open. Actually, I actually had to shut my eyes so that he could do it. I said, I'm going to go in knowing and I'm going to sign up for this. Now, how does this at all relate to you as the spouse of an addict or an alcoholic? Well, if you're, if you're, you know, lucky enough to have the spidey senses and to know, uh, growing up and ha to develop this empathic ability and this, um, bu inner bullshit detector, you can kind of see the reality of things a lot quicker, but if you didn't necessarily do that, or you don't realize the impact of your own childhood and you married into this dynamic, and this is kind of new to you, you're like, well, I don't know our, our family didn't have any of this. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea what I'm dealing with here. Then then you're, you're, you you're going in there without any one. You don't know who you're dealing with. You don't know what you're dealing with. And number two, you can't make a decision if you want to deal in it or not, if you don't even know what it is that you're dealing with. And here, let me explain. You marry this person 
and you, you start this beautiful relationship with them and maybe you met them and they told you they were in recovery or they didn't. I, maybe they, they had no issues before or you know whatever the scenario is, I've heard it all. But you get into this relationship with them and then all of a sudden you get blindsided and over time, they start to become like a different person. And you start to get confused as to who you're dealing with, right? And you do this thing called splitting where sometimes you think you're dealing with John and he's a great guy and a great provider and a really good man and a good husband and a good dad until he drinks too much. And then he checks out, he goes in the garage, does his thing, or he falls down or he rough houses with the kids, or he gets angry at you, or he says stupid shit, or he does wrong. He makes bad decisions with his money, but you know, he's still just John though, but would be, but there's drunk, drunk John and regular John. And so you go about your life in your family as a spouse of an addict and alcoholic dealing with this split personality and you start treating them like a split personality. So when they are under the influence, you start to minimize, you start to rationalize, you start to justify, and you start to sweep things under the rug and say, well, that's not really who they are. They're really this person over here. Same thing can be true if you're in a, in a relationship, uh, a partnership of any kind with, with anybody. It could be a parent. But for spouses, because this is like new to so many of you that go through this, the blind side of it really confuses you as to who you're dealing with. So what I want you to understand is it's not a question of who you're dealing with anymore. All right. When you look at this spouse over time, what happens is it becomes what you're dealing with instead of who you're dealing with. And that's why knowing what you're dealing with will change your life. You're not dealing with John, who's drunk John, sober John. You're not dealing with Mary, who's great Mary and high Mary. You're not, you're not dealing with these two different people. You're dealing with addiction. And addiction is its own animal. It, it, it is, there's something called an addictive personality. Now, most people get this wrong. They think that you're born with an addictive personality, right? You have a propensity to want to be, we, you know, I was just born this way. I was born addicted. But the truth is less than 2% of the population is born addicted. And those babies go through withdrawal and that's how that works, right? But the rest of us who dealt with substance use disorder on the spectrum of any kind train ourselves into addiction over time. And it's on a spectrum. And believe me, when I tell you, it doesn't get any better on its own. That's why it's addiction, Okay. It's like, well, I just can cool out. That's, that's, that's a, a normie does that not, not an addicted person. Right. Uh, that's a whole nother video for another time, another lesson for another time about you, you going one day at a time is, is crazy. But let me, let me explain how, when you know what you're dealing with is the addicted personality is what takes over and hijacks the person that is the addict or alcoholic. That is, that is the person inside of there. And so over time, they start to develop this addicted personality, which looks a lot like narcissistic personality disorder. Addiction is a psychological disorder. It's not just a physiological, a craving for something. It is a psychological disorder. There's a part of the brain that's broken and never heals again. So whenever we really rectify that and come to terms with that, we start to treat it more appropriately like the disorder it is, not a disease, but a disorder, a, a psychological disorder. And then we go, now that I know what I'm dealing with, do I want to sign up for what it is that I'm dealing with? Let me give you an example. You minimize or justify whenever, let's say, uh, you know, Renee has a great day. And then all of a sudden she goes off the rails and she's not there for the kids or she picks them up late or she does the whole hula hand or whatever happens, or she yells at the kids, or she's really sharp with them with homework or throws the dish or does the dumb shit. And you go, well, that's not really Renee because yesterday when Renee, Renee was great, you know, yesterday, Renee sat at, we had dinner and it was amazing. And we went out for sushi. I mean, we had a, a beautiful time and that, that's not Renee. This is Renee. And then you tell your kids that too. You're like, well, that's not really mom. Mom had an off night. You start to minimize and do all the things. It's kind of like this. Okay. If I was in a family dynamic and I was dealing with somebody who had Alzheimer's, for example, okay, I, uh, an elderly parent or even early onset, you know, a person in my life that had Alzheimer's and we're the family. And I would say to that person, they're mean and which happens sometimes, right? With Alzheimer's, they can get out of, you know, uh, really like out of their mind in many ways where emotionally they're all of it. So let's say, and I'm not an expert in that. I'm an expert in addiction, but I, 
stay with me because the parallel counts here. If somebody has an Alzheimer's issue and one day they remember your name and they're sweet to the family and they're like, oh yeah, that's my daughter. And oh yeah, I recognize you and you see you and the whole family weeps and cries and they're like, yes, mom knows who we are. She remembers. That is a moment. That is a snapshot in time, but there is no way in hell you're going to go, mom's all better now. Let's put her on a bus to Albuquerque and send her on her way and she can take care of herself. That's never going to happen because you accept the mental diagnosis that this person has right? So you know what you're dealing with in Alzheimer's and then you can prepare the whole family. You can say, well, you know, there's a moment. Yeah. There's glimpses of mom in there, isn't there? And those are great times. And don't we love to see that? But this is what we're dealing with as a family. That's the same conversations you want to be having with yourself and with your children in your household. Yes. There are glimpses of dad. Yes. Dad's in and out. Yep. Mom's in and out. There are glimpses of that, but this is a psychological problem. This is a disorder that there needs to be a recovery process. And I have other videos here. I'll link to the playlist of how, especially one called how to talk to your children about a parent's addiction. But again, if you want this more two-way street kind of dialogue where you can come to me and tell me this is your exact situation. This is, you know, the, 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 the thing that's happening in your house because everybody's unique. Everybody has a different circumstance, even though I know that there are lots of familiarities across the board that bought, that tie us all together. You still are unique, uh, your own individual, and you have your own questions and concerns. And I want to be able to go address those and answer those. And I do that inside of my private containers where we have these small groups. And believe me, even the most resistant people to groups, I, I want to tell you, I used to be one of them too. I was like, I don't want to hear your shit. I just want to deal with my stuff. I don't want to have time for your shit. But here's what I know to be true after running these groups for all the time I've been doing it is healing happens in this small community. Healing happens when we bring each other together because whatever brilliance I bring to the table pales, pales in the comparison to the to the whole of the group, the, the questions everybody's bringing in the conversation that everybody's bringing in that group. And also it's just great to know that you're not alone and to feel supported. And it's different than other kind of support groups where you would go in and just kind of feel, find the support. This, I give you strategy. This is a coaching container. This is a two-way street. This is a, I tell you exactly what uh, to say, how to, you know, maneuver in this. Uh, I give you the strategies and the tools and, and that you need in order to navigate this successfully. Because people tell you all the time, well, you have no control, you know what I mean? And that's true, right? Like you have no control over this, but here's what you do have, massive influence. And now I've seen it. I've seen it with hundreds of families that I've helped where the, people would say, oh my God, they're never going to get better. They're never going to make any moves. But because you knew how to stand your ground and set and hold those boundaries and what do what you believe in, things happen. Changes were made. And I have to tell you, you know this to be true. Whether they get better or not, you deserve to get better. And the whole family needs to get better too. And we're all impacted by this, right? Not just one person. Addiction doesn't impact one person. It impacts the whole entire family. So the first step is to know what you're dealing with. Now, how do you do that? Is I've given you a little taste. I've given you a little hint of some education around addiction, but there is so much more because the truth is there are so many myths about addiction. There are so many misunderstandings, even coming out of the mouths of addicts and alcoholics who do not understand how they got here and what this is all about. They still believe that their trauma created this addiction, or they still believe that they were born this way, or they still believe it's a disease they have no control over. They believe all of these things that are really perpetuating this, this, this epidemic in life. And I'm on a mission. That's why I founded the Codependency Institute. That's why I became, you know, I decided I'm going to be the family empowerment warrior and I'm going to come out here and I'm going to dedicate my life to helping you understand the impact of addiction on the whole entire family and the tools you need to break your family free. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. So if you're interested in having me come alongside you and do that, the next step would be to pour your resources, your time and investment into coming into one of these private containers where I'm gonna give you everything you need to know. Everything you need to know to know exactly what you're dealing with and if you wanna deal with it from that point on. Should you stay? Should you go? What do you need to do moving forward? If that sounds like, man, that's right up your alley, I'm singing your song. I'd be happy to come alongside of you and pour into you and support you on this journey. I love you. Take excellent care of yourself and make sure that you leave a comment or subscribe so that you get notifications whenever we put out a new episode, especially of these, what I'm loving so much are warrior talks. Until the next time, see you soon.